Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for with the hard work and uh, putting together this program for everyone. And also give me the opportunity to speak here today. So in line with this week's mini course, I'll be talking about truncated toplets operators. So I'll give a brief um, background of how the symbols of bounded trope on the symbols of bounded truncated toplets operators. Um, I'll talk about some things we know and also some things we don't know. And then I'll move on to the case for symbols of compact truncated toplets operators where um, in general less is known. Uh, so just to um, keep everyone on the same page, I'll give a brief uh, background in some of the theory um, and to introduce some notation. So I'll let T be the unit circle in the complex plane. I'll let M be this normalized Lebesgue measure on T. Uh, we'll denote C of T to be a space of continuous functions on T. So we've seen a mini course on the hardest space um, and we've also seen it introduced today. But the hardest space uh, HP for P between one and infinity uh, I'll define as a closed subspace of LP, T of M, consisting of all functions F, <coughs> such that the negative Fourier coefficients of F are zero. And then as is a standard procedure, um, I will extend this from extend the hardest space from functions defined on the unit circle to functions defined, analytic functions defined in the unit disk by taking my Fourier coefficients of my function f, the sequence a n, and I'll put these as my coefficients of my analytic function in the disk. And then um, with this construction, if you take your analytic function of the disk, you take radial limits, uh, you recover a function defined almost everywhere on the unit circle. And then that function is the original function you started with. Um, so you're back to where you began. Just, just like a sanity check to make, thing, make sure things work out as you expect. Uh, so we get to see a course on inner functions, but um, inner functions are defined as functions of HP, which are unimodular almost everywhere on T. Uh, I'll define HP zero to be the set of all functions in HP, which vanish at zero. And then I'll define a model space. So this model space is this K subscript I superscript P notation. So we've seen a course of model spaces and uh, an introduction to model spaces earlier today in the truncated toplets operators mini course. That was mostly done in the context of P equals two, but, um, things generalize nicely to the case for P in between one and infinity. So it's just defined as the complex conjugate of HP zero multiplied by I, where this multiplication is understood on the circle, on the circle intersected with HP. Uh, and I'll let PI be the orthogonal projection from L2 to the model space corresponding to inner function I. And the nicest example of the model, of a model space is when the inner function i is just z to the n, and then your model space is just the span of all coefficients of z up to including n minus one. Okay, so we've seen um, a definition of truncated topics operator already once today. But I'll just briefly reintroduce the operator. So uh, the TTO um, is defined by taking a function in a model space multiplying it by some function G, um, which you call the symbol TTO and in general, this will lie in L2, and then projecting back to your model space. In general, this is a densely defined operator. Um, so I've, here I've said has this domain, set of all functions in the model space, which multiplied by G to be in L2. You could equally just take this as, you could equally um, densely define this on the domain of all bounded functions in your model space. It's just a matter of convention. Everything works out the same. Uh, some things to note. Um, a truncated toplets operator with a bounded symbol is bounded. That's just because multiplication by a bounded symbol is a bounded operation and projections are always bounded. So it's just a composition to bounded maps. Uh, We've seen this earlier again. So unlike toplets operators, 
symbols of truncated toplitz operators aren't unique. Um, and earlier it was demonstrated that if you take a symbol in this complex conjugate of IH2 plus IH2, the truncated toplitz operator of that symbol is equal to zero. And again, unlike toplitz operators, some unbounded symbols here will actually give bounded truncated toplitz operators. So yeah, so if you, these two points, if you take any bounded function, you add on some extra part of your symbol, which essentially gives you a zero operator. Um, you're going to have a bounded truncated toplitz operator if you put this G as your symbol. And in general, this space of functions will contain unbounded functions. Um, so this is very different to the case of toplitz operators, ordinary toplitz operators. And it's precisely for these two reasons why studying the symbols of truncated toplitz operators is fundamentally more challenging than studying the symbols of toplitz operators. So I suppose the first natural question you can ask um, so we've seen here a bounded symbol gives you a bounded operator. And also there's lots of freedom of choice of your symbol. So lots of different, one truncated toplitz operator can have many different symbols. So a question you can pose, and this question was actually posed by Saracen in his um, 2007 paper, his seminal paper, um, is does every bounded TTO have a bounded symbol? Uh, this was posed in 2007, I think around about two years later, this question was answered in the negative. Uh, and it was answered <clears throat> with this theorem. So if you have a inner function which has an angular derivative at some zeta in T, so this uh, this means that the, the value of the inner function at zeta uh, exists, so the radial limit as you approach zeta exists. And also the radial limit as you approach um, zeta of theta prime also exists. It's also equivalent to the reproducing kernel at zeta lying in the model space. Um, so if we take a reproducing kernel, take p between two and infinity, then we have this equivalence of conditions. So it turns out that this product is k zeta cross k zeta, um, which is explicitly defined by taking f to the inner product of f and k zeta, and then multiplying this by k zeta. Although this doesn't um, immediately take the form of a bounded truncated toplitz operator, it turns out that this is in fact a truncated toplitz operator. And that's been known since for quite some time, since the uh, 2007 paper of Saracen. And that bounded TTO having a symbol phi and LP is actually equivalent to the reproducing kernel at zeta lying in LP. So with this theorem, what you can do, and exactly what the authors do do, um, is to say that if you have a reproducing kernel at zeta, which doesn't lie in LP, for some p between two and infinity, then this bounded TTO um, won't have a symbol in LP, so it certainly won't have a symbol in infinity. And there are very concrete numerical conditions for when this reproducing kernel lies in LP or equivalently doesn't lie in LP. Um, so you can come up with very concrete examples of bounded TTOs without a bounded symbol. So I suppose the next natural question, once this question has been answered, is to consider when does every bounded TTO on some model space have a bounded symbol? Um, and there are some yeah, so around about two years after this question was answered, again, this question has been answered. Uh, this question was answered with the following theorem. Um, so it actually gives two different equivalent conditions for any bounded TTO having a bounded symbol. So condition two is a um, like a, a measure theoretic embedding theory type condition. So the class CP or CP of I is set of all complex Borel measures on the circle such that this embedding from the model space, oh, sorry, embedding from the model space 
to this weighted LP space is continuous. And condition two says when this coincides for I squared, um, for P equals one and for P equals two, that's actually equivalent to every bounded TTO having a bounded symbol. Condition three is a, um, a weak factorization type condition. So if you notice here, this space somewhat resembles a uh, model space with exponent p equal to one. Um, and if you can factor every function f in here as a sum of a product of functions lying in the model space with exponent p equal to two, along with the summability condition, that's again equivalent to every bounded TTO having a bounded symbol. Um, so we won't necessarily pursue the technical details of this theorem much further, um, but this question does have an answer, a satisfying answer. So that's, I suppose, everything we know about um, bounded TTOs uh, and when they have a bounded symbol. So uh, what about things we don't know? So you say an inner function i is one component if and only if there's some eta between zero and one, such that this level set here is connected. So one component inner functions, they've been studied um, independently uh, just for their own properties. But it turns out that um, quite a long standing open conjecture in the field um, basically states or conjectures that every bounded TTO on a model space corresponding to inner function i has a bounded symbol if and only if this inner function is one component. So in other words, this conjecture, uh, conjecture, this conjecture says these two or these three equivalent conditions um, in the theorem are satisfied if and only if i is one component. So that's as it stands still wide open. Well, I mean, the yes, that part of this conjecture is open. So there is a partial result, which stems from um, a result due to Alexandrov. So Alexandrov has uh, classified the one component inner functions to be exactly all the inner functions, such that the this class CP, which we've seen earlier, uh, all the measures which make this embedding continuous, if these actually coincide for all P between zero and infinity, um, so yeah, they coincide for all p between zero and infinity if and only if i is one component. So by the previous theorem, um, we can know if i is one component, then so is i squared. Um, and then if i squared is one component, all the classes coincide for, this classes of CP coincide for all p between zero and infinity. So in particular, they coincide for p equals one and p equals two. So it's Condition two is actually satisfied. So we do have one direction of this conjecture, we just don't have the, the other direction. Um, which is quite interesting because this conjecture is all to do with um, truncated toplitz operators, but because of all the previous work, this conjecture now has been boiled down. Um, and the only thing essentially left to prove is that if this condition two holds, so if these classes coincide for p equal to one and p equal to two, then that actually implies that they coincide for all p between zero and infinity. So what's left isn't a problem that immediately resembles truncated Toplitz operators, it's just a problem in this um, to do with embeddings. Okay, so yeah, so that's everything um, to do with bounded truncated Toplitz operators. So how about compact truncated Toplitz operators? So for compact TTOs, the role of this bounded symbols seems to be replaced by symbols of the form um, i, or i is your inner function, multiplied by a continuous function on the circle. So if you have um, a function g, which is in this class i multiplied by a continuous function, then the TTO with symbol g on the model space corresponding to i is compact. And it isn't, it's not too surprising here that continuous functions um, seem to have a role to play. And the reason for that is because in some ways, TTOs are actually more similar to Hankel operators than they are to Toplitz operators. 
and the compact Hankel operators are exactly the operators which have a continuous symbol. So I suppose a question which uh, I pose and I'd like to answer is that are there conditions on I which are equivalent to every compact TTO on the model space corresponding to I having a symbol in this class of functions I multiplied by continuous functions? So this is an analogous question to that was posed and answered for the case of bounded TTOs and bounded symbols. So we'll be seeking conditions here um, which resemble this, these conditions two and three here. Uh, so it may seem actually like I'm um, jumping ahead of myself and um, I suppose a more natural question to ask initially is that uh, if there are compact truncated topless operators without, which don't have a symbol um, in this class of functions, I multiplied by CT. And it turns out the answer is yes. Um, and if you look at the example of the bounded TTO without a bounded symbol, um, so this truncated topless operator here, this is a finite rank truncated topless operator. So it's immediately as compact, it's rank one, so it's compact. And this, by this uh, result, this doesn't have a bounded symbol. So if it doesn't have a bounded symbol, it certainly can't have the symbol in the class of functions I multiplied by continuous functions. So the same example of a bounded TTO without a bounded symbol gives you an example of a compact T TTO without a symbol in I multiplied by continuous functions. So it's a bit of a non-starter question. So we focus solely on this question. Um, something immediate that can be uh, kind of gleaned from other known results. Um, you can deduce that if every bounded TTO on the model space corresponding to I has a bounded symbol, then every compact TTO on that same model space will have a symbol in I multiplied by CT. So for the rest of the talk, I'll basically be answering this question. To do this, I need to define this Banach space X. So this is defined as the sum of all products of functions, uh, one lying in the model space, one lying in the conjugate of the model space, along with this summability condition. And the norm on this space is just defined as the infimum of this value over all possible representations of the function. Uh, so we have to consider this bounded map S, which takes X to the model space with exponent P equal to one, an inner function I squared intersected with the shifted hard, shifted hard space, um, where the map S just sends, sends F to IF, so it's just multiplication by I. So what I would like to do is to find the adjoint and the pre-adjoint of this map S. So the, the pre-adjoint of um, S is a map a bounded map such that if you take the adjoint of the pre-adjoint of S, you're left with S. So it behaves um, how you would expect. So to do this, I need to know the dual space and the pre-dual space of both X and of my co-domain of S. Um, fortunately, some previous known results have identified the dual space of X uh, as all bounded TTOs on model space, which I would denote by calligraphic T of I, and the pre-dual of X, which is, I'll use the notation star of X, is all compact TTOs um, on the model space, and I'll use calligraphic T with subscript C for compact. So that's the previous, um, that this kind of identification has been known before. Can also describe the dual and pre-dual of the um, model space intersected with the shifted Hardy space with this theorem. So the dual space is identified with the quotient space of, uh, of all bounded functions quotiented by this space Q, where Q is bounded functions in H2 plus the conjugate of I squared H2. Again, there's a similar um, kind of identification for the pre-dual of the space, uh, just with bounded, bounded uh, functions now replaced by continuous functions. Um, so it's a quotient of continuous functions quotiented by 
continuous functions intersected with space fi squared, where fi squared is the closure of this, this space in the weak star topology of L infinity. Um, so the technical details or under identification of the dual and pre dual aren't too uh, fundamentally important for the purposes of this talk. We just need to identify the dual and the pre dual of this space so we can describe the adjoint and the pre adjoint of S. So the adjoint, oh, sorry, the pre adjoint um, takes the equivalence class of F to the TTO with symbol given by i multiplied by f. Um, and the adjoint of s does the same thing, but we're now acting on our domain and our co-domain are now bigger spaces. So this theorem, this theorem you can um, actually deduce just by tracking how some bounded linear maps behave um, once you've identified the dual and the pre-dual of um, both x and the model space intersected with the shifted Hardy space. So now staring at this theorem, um, you can immediately deduce the corollary that the image of star s is all truncated topolitz operators with symbols in the class of functions i multiplied by continuous functions. And the image of s star is all TTOs with a bounded symbol. So that corollary follows quite immediately from this theorem. And then with this corollary, you can make quite a powerful observation, um, which is every compact TTO on model space corresponding to I has a symbol, having a symbol in I multiplied by continuous functions is actually equivalent to the map star S being isomorphic. And the reason for that is because the map star of S, the pre-adjoint of S, is always bounded, it's always injective. So it's isomorphic exactly when it's um, surjective. And by this corollary, it's surjective exactly when a set of all truncated toplets operators with symbols in I multiplied by CT is equal to the set of all compact truncated toplets operators. In other words, it's isomorphic exactly when every compact truncated toplets operator um, on the model space corresponding to I has a symbol in I multiplied by CT. Then if star S is isomorphic, as we're true with any Banach space isomorphism, S is isomorphic, the adjoint of an isomorphism is an isomorphism. Again, by the same reasoning, S star is isomorphic. So if S star is isomorphic, in particular it's surjective, again, by using this corollary, if S star is surjective, the image of S star, that is all TTOs with the bound, all TTOs with the bounded symbol, has to be equal to a set of all bounded TTOs. In other words, every bounded TTO um, on the model space corresponding to I must have a bounded symbol <coughs> must have a bounded symbol. So we've managed to deduce that uh, every compact TTO on the model space having a symbol with I multiplied by CT implies every bounded TTO on the same model space has a bounded symbol. And if you recall, one of the first things I said was actually the converse to this statement also holds, and that can be gleaned from some previously known results. Um, that allows you to deduce the theorem that every compact TTO on a model space having a symbol in I multiplied by CT is actually equivalent to every bounded TTO on the same model space having a bounded symbol. Then with that theorem, we can return to our question, which is are there conditions on I which are equivalent to every compact TTO on a model space having a symbol in this class of functions? And the answer to that is actually yes. And by this theorem, this has to be the same conditions on I which are equivalent to every bounded TTO having a bounded symbol. So it's this embedding type condition, equivalent condition two we've seen before and the condition three we've seen previously as well. So all I've really done here um, is I've actually just taken two different problems um, and then purely using the notion of duality by cooking up some maps and looking at the, the, uh, the adjoint of these maps, I've shown that these two difficult problems are equivalent. And then I've used all the previous, reserve, all the previous work um, to do all the heavy lifting and deduce a theorem which describes when 
which just gives some equivalent conditions where the compact TTO on a model space has a symbol and I multiplied by CT. I uh, have maybe in the remaining one minute, I'll just um, explain how this can relate to this conjecture about um, one component in the functions. So this open conjecture basically conjectures that every bounded TTO on the model space is a bounded symbol if and only if I is one component. By this previous theorem, um, this conjecture is actually completely equivalent to the conjecture which states that every compact TTO on model space corresponding to I has a symbol and I multiplied by CT if and only if I is one component. So it'll be interesting to see if um, this new view on this conjecture makes the problem in any way more approachable with anything to be gained by working with compact operators um, and a smaller class of uh, symbols than um, bounded TTOs and bounded functions. But that's everything I have to say. So thanks very much. Thank the speaker. Does anyone have any questions for Ryan? Maybe I have one question um, uh, concerning the 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 theorem um, you have you had or or the theorem of ba uh, Baranov and Bezonov and Kapustin uh, add. Uh, so there is this, this equality of uh, uh, set uh, uh, C1, I2, and uh, yeah, that one. So condition two. Uh, I just, I'm just wondering if uh, we can say that, uh, in fact, for CP, I2, where P is between one and two, uh, all the classes uh, coincide. Is it? Two or I'm, I'm, I don't know it. Uh, oh, so does this condition mean that the classes coincide for all p be strictly between one and two? Yeah, that's my um, question. I don't know. Good question. Um, I can't say I've thought about this condition two in too much detail. Um, because uh, the conjecture, in fact, if you want to prove the conjecture, you, you need to prove that uh, all classes. Uh, uh, coincide and uh, okay. I'm just wondering if we get something weaker, but still interesting um, in in direction of the conjecture. And... Yeah, no, it would be interesting to know if if this actually implies um, would that if it would imply very cool for p between one and two. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah, I can't tell if that would be a, if that would follow immediately or if it wouldn't or if it would take some work. But yeah, it's a good question. I can't say I can give you a, a direct answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any other questions? Let's uh, thank Ryan again. Thank you all uh, for turning out.